Tonight we're going to look at Ezekiel chapters 2 and 3. So let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 5, and uh, we'll go through uh, both chapters. Now, probably going to speak kind of rapidly tonight, but then again, we'll see, I don't know. Beginning at verse 1, Ezekiel chapter 2, reading to verse 5. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. Now, as we saw last time we were together, we saw that Ezekiel is a young man, he's a prophet, more than likely is around 30 years of age, and as we looked at the first chapter of Ezekiel, we saw that he had a, an incredible spiritual experience because in chapter 1, we see that this young man, this prophet, 30 years of age, uh, saw the majesty and saw the glory of God. Now, we need to put this into some kind of context. We need first to understand that at the age of 30, he probably could have been impressed by the surroundings that he found himself in because he was in a majestic city. He was in the city of Babylon. And Babylon was known for being an incredibly beautiful city. As a matter of fact, they had there during that time uh, one of what is called the seven wonders of the ancient world. They had the hanging garden of Babylon there. And he had opportunity to see the majesty and the beauty of one of the most incredible cities that the world has ever seen. And yet, in the midst of all of this beauty and all of this natural splendor and, and, and in the midst of, of all of this man-made wonder, uh, he still hadn't succumbed to that. The natural and man-made beauty had an appeal to some, but it wasn't an appeal to him. Ezekiel had a higher sense. He had a higher sense of beauty, and he had an awareness of a greater glory. And that's what keeps you from getting ripped off by the baubles, if you will, of the world. That's what keeps me from being trapped by the things of the world. You see, in the New Testament, in 1 John, in chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, the apostle John said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Ezekiel was somebody who could see the splendor and beauty and, and all that, that was surrounding him and yet not succumb to its temptation or its appeal to yield to it and to compromise his walk with God because he saw something with the eye of faith that was beyond anything that a human being could ever construct. He saw something that gave him more insight. He, he saw something in the future that was far more glorious. He saw something in a spiritual sense that kept him centered when it came to just living in the world. It reminds me of something we hear about uh, with Abraham. It's, it's recorded in, in Hebrews chapter 11, how that in verses 9 and 10, by faith Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And so when you have that kind of mentality, when, when heaven is far more glorious than anything earth has for you, then you're going to be able to journey through. You're going to be one of those who says, I'm just passing through. I'm just moving on. I'm a stranger in a, in a strange land. I'm a foreigner here. I'm just passing through. I'm a pilgrim. It reminds me a bit of Moses, again in, in Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he looked for the reward. 
And so this is what we see in the man Ezekiel, someone who's looking beyond the natural, somebody who's looking beyond the physical, something that is beyond the natural beauty uh, or even, even the, uh, the things that man can create. He, he saw something far more glorious than that. He, he saw something that kept him moving. And in chapter 1, he saw the glory of God. He had seen angels, and, and, and as we looked at this, we saw that they were rather fantastic-looking um, creatures and all, but he, these angels, these cherubim, he saw them, and, and we know that, that what he was looking at in chapter 1 in reality is what would be called a throne chariot. He was seeing that these cherubim who had been um, created by God who actually guard his holiness and, and righteousness and all, uh, he saw these angels and he saw them in this vision as we saw it here in chapter 1. He had seen the glory of God. He had, had seen the throne of God. He saw the appearance of a man on that throne in chapter 1, verse 26. And, and around him he saw a rainbow, which was a way of reminding us of God's mercy and grace. And as he has seen all of this incredible uh, revelation and all, well, when we left off in chapter 1, he says in verse uh, 28, the last portion, when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. And so in the midst of all of this, his response was to just fall in, in, in a sense of fear, and, and he was awestruck. And so there he is on his face. And, and so verse 1 says, He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. So as he's seeing this uh, revelation of glory, he, he, he falls on his face, and, and so the Lord begins to speak to him, and, and God is right now about to commission him, and that's what happens. He says, I, I will speak to you, and then verse 2, then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and, and set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. And so I want you to see this here, and I'm going to develop this for just a moment. Notice verse 2. Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. I heard him. So one, when God calls you, he also finds it necessary to equip you, even as I said before, with power to perform what he commands. And I would believe that even from the beginning, the most important thing for us to understand is our utter need for His help in our lives. We cannot do anything that is pleasing to God without Him making it possible through His strengthening. In 2 Corinthians, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes that very clear in chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. What makes me capable of doing the things that pleases Him, to take what He has commissioned me to, to communicate, well, what makes me sufficient is, is, is God Himself, His Holy Spirit who empowers me. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. And so that's how it works in the spiritual realm. That's how it works in the world. Listen, you can have some natural gifts, abilities, talents. You might have a, a gift of speech and eloquence. You might have an intellect. You might have the ability to communicate very well. People listen to you. You're, they're spellbound by the way you speak and all of that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're called by God to be a teacher of the Word of God. That simply means that you're very adept at certain things and you have natural skills and, and, and abilities. God will take you and God will fill you with His Holy Spirit. He'll give you a task that is far beyond your natural, natural strength and ability. He'll say, go fulfill that task. You'll find yourself to be incapable of doing it. You fall on your face before the Lord and say, without your help, it's impossible. And God gives you the power to do it. So when God commissions you, He also equips you. And, and not only did he commission him and, and, and call him and empower him, but he gave to him a ministry. And the ministry is found in verse 3 when he speaks to him and says, Son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel. And then he describes his ministry. These are going to be a rebellious people. It's a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have tra transgressed against me to this very day. So this is going to be your ministry. You're going to go speak to a rebellious, transgressing, impudent and stubborn people. 
Now, what's interesting, and I want you to see this, look in verse 3 how he speaks of it as being a rebellious nation. Now, that word nation in the English doesn't bear the translation that you might, you might find interesting when you see it in the, in the original language. The original language, Hebrew, it, it's a word goy. When we go to Israel, as we'll do tomorrow, we leave tomorrow to go to Israel. And so when we go into Israel, there's a word that they use for us, and it's not American. Uh, what they call us is goy. You know, you're goy, G-O-Y, uh, plural goyim. You are foreigners. You are Gentiles. It simply means that you're not Jewish. So I find it interesting, and, and I believe that, that the Lord is, is stating something very clearly here when he says to, to him, Son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel, but he refers to them as a rebellious nation. So what he's speaking of is saying these, these people are acting like they're pagans. They're acting like, like heathens. They're, they're speaking and living as if they don't have a relationship with me at all. These are people who are like the nations around them. Now, throughout their history, Israel continually rebelled against the Lord. We know that eventually the ten northern tribes had been taken and, 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 and been... Uh, uh, spread out through the, uh, the Assyrians. And, and we know that almost 100 years or 100 years or so later on that the two southern tribes had been taken by, by Nebuchadnezzar. And, and what had happened is as they had become exiled. And that's what Ezekiel's dealing with because he's in exile in Babylon. Now, there were contemporary prophets during the time of Ezekiel. We know that. I mentioned that to you last time. Daniel was a contemporary. Jeremiah was a contemporary of Ezekiel. They prophesied during the same period. And in Jeremiah, in chapter 2, we get some insight into what the Lord is talking about when he speaks of them being a rebellious nation. Because in Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 13, God said, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Now, we... Americans who are used to having our water basically piped into us uh, don't really live under a, a system that uses cisterns. But when you go to Israel, you'll discover that they have these huge, uh, huge water reservoirs that are referred to as cisterns. Because they didn't have a large river system, they weren't like in Egypt where they had the mighty Nile, they have the Jordan, and the Jordan sometimes dries up. It's, it gets small in some areas, so, 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 so much so that you could almost jump over the Jordan in some places. I mean, it's very, very small in some places, wide in others. And, but it's not a mighty river at all like, like the Egyptians have the Nile and all. It's not like the Euphrates there in Babylon. Uh, it, it's different. And, and so what happened is the Lord had stated to them when they were coming out of Egyptian bondage that he was taking to them to a land that didn't have a mighty water source. He said, so what you're going to do is you're going to rely on me because I'm going to bring the early and the latter rain. And, and the rain is going to be how you're going to be able to, to survive. It's not going to be off the Jordan River. It's going to be through me supplying to you through my own uh, bringing of the weather for you, the, the rains in the early and latter portion of the season, and that's how you're going to be able to survive. Well, when it was a dry season, they needed to have water, and so they had created a cistern system, and so what would happen is they would dig out uh, through a rock, they would dig into that rock, and they would have it in such a way that they could actually uh, get water to be uh, put into that, and they could save multiple thousands and thousands of gallons of water, and it would be a private water reservoir for them. But what they would do is they'd hew it out of the rock, then they would plaster it, then they would allow the water to be collected in it, and they would put a seal over it so that it didn't become um, polluted, and then when it was dry and they were in need of water, they would go and drop their bucket in or whatever source they had of, of, of getting the water out, and then they'd have their water supply until it rained again. But what had happened, and what God is talking about, is you have a cistern, a system that is religious, that is likened to a cistern. He said, and you're, you're relying on this water system that is in a reservoir. But you didn't notice that that, that that reservoir that you have, that cistern that you have created, has hairline fractures. And the water that you've been storing for that day that you're thirsty is actually seeped through. And because it has seeped through, when you drop your bucket into that system and you're trying to get something that will produce water to quench your spiritual thirst, 
you will discover that there's nothing in that system. And that's what God is talking about. And that's what happened. They created a religious system that had no water. He said, what you did is you forsook me, the fountain of living water. And you hewed for yourself cisterns that are broken that can hold no water. So in your spiritual thirst, when you go and try and, and collect something, when you're afraid or in need and, and you cry unto that system, it cannot produce for you because it's broken. It's unable to give to you water. And, and that's why you, you connect uh, Jeremiah 2.13 with Jesus' promise that he would give you living water and you understand that a relationship with God is much more than just a human devised system. And what happened here during the time of Ezekiel, as well as Jeremiah and Daniel, is they had turned away from the Lord and they had created for the, themselves a cistern system that kept them from having a real relationship with God. Isaiah speaks of the same mentality in Isaiah 30, verse 10, when he says, They say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Say things to us that will make us feel good about ourselves, but please don't bring any conviction into our lives. And so the Lord speaks about them in verses 4 and 5. He says they are impudent and stubborn children. The word impudent means that they're obstinate, they're hardened, they're stubborn. It, it literally means they are hard of face and hard of heart. They are shameless in their sinfulness. This is the kind of people you're going to speaking, be speaking to. These, are, these people are unreceptive. These are people who are hardened by sin. God's word is found to be true. God's word will come to pass. When you speak, they're going to discover, as it says in verse 5, they're going to know that a prophet has been among them, but they're going to reject you. I mean, God from the very beginning is telling Ezekiel, don't be expecting massive revival through your ministry. When you speak to them, they're going to have a hardened heart and their outer appearance is going to be resistant to the things that you have to say. When you speak to them, they're not going to be there saying, tell me more, I want to hear more about this God. I want to know how to get right with God. They're not going to have that attitude at all. And your ministry is going to be effective, but in a way that you probably aren't e expecting. He says in verse 6, And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you and you dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now, when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me. There was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. You have a commission. Be faithful to deliver the message that I've entrusted to you. You know, I have an opportunity as a minister to very often go and speak to various, various places. I, I, I take outside uh, opportunities fairly often. Normally, I'll speak at a men's conference or a pastor's or leader's conference, and, and uh, you know, there are times that, that you speak to hundreds and sometimes you speak to dozens, but sometimes you'll speak to thousands. And, and I'll go and I'll, and I'll share here in this church. Uh, every time I open up the Bible, there are a lot of people around. And, 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 and you know, there's normally a, a group of people there who are, are fairly receptive to the things that are being said. You know, I, I don't have to walk out here saying, oh, no, I'm going to be afraid of their faces. You know, they're going to be giving me looks and they're going to be just so obstinate and they're going to be refusing. You know, you don't give me that look. You may have that in your heart, but I can't see it on your face. You know, when I come out, you know, and speak to you, it's very comfortable. It's like speaking to family. You know, so there's not this sense where I have to be, uh, oh, Lord, do I have to go speak to them again? It's not that at all. But he's got a, an unreceptive audience. It's, it's one thing to speak to your family. It's one thing to speak to the church that you pastor. It's one thing to speak in a conference with leaders who are in agreement, basically, with where you're at and want to hear from you. It's another thing. When you're speaking to a group of people who do not want to hear a word that you have to say, who are not only resistant but angry towards you and could be hurtful to you, 
It's an entirely different kind of thing when you have to take a message, especially the message God has given to him. It's a message of coming judgment. It's a message that God is not happy with the nation and God is going to deal with it, a message that, that, that Ezekiel normally wouldn't want to give. It's not something that he would necessarily create. It's not like you're saying to yourself, how can I win people over? How can I influence them? How can I make them my friends? This message that God has given to Ezekiel isn't a message like that. And so God is speaking to him and saying to him, listen, you're going to speak to a rebellious people. They're stubborn and they're impudent. They're hard-hearted and, they're, and, they're, and they have hard faces. They're going to not want to hear the things that you have to say. You know one of the hardest, most difficult Bible studies that I've ever given was in a Christian high school? I was invited in the same year to go speak at Alta Loma High School to a religions class comparative religions class, and, and the teacher there called and said, could you come and teach my, my kids something about Christianity? This many, many years ago, and I said, well, of course. And so I went to the class there. I sat down with the kids. There was about 30 kids, high school kids. I gave a Bible study through the Gospel of Matthew, explained what, what Christianity teaches, what we believe as, as Christians. It was part of their curricula, and it was okay to do that, and I did, and I shared with them about those things. And and these are kids who were, by and large, unchurched. I mean, these were kids, these kids were not a high school class that were, you know, all Christians. These kids came from all kinds of backgrounds and everything. And, and they were respectful. They listened. They asked questions and things like that. And, and, and I really enjoyed myself with those high school kids. And then, during the same uh, year, I was invited to go speak at a Christian high school. And when I went there, I took one of our worship teams. I did a chapel there. And I have never felt... I have never felt such an obstinate refusal to hear the message that was given as I did there. I had a better reception in a non-Christian high school than I did in a Christian school. It was an amazing experience for me. And that's what the Lord is saying here. He's saying, listen, the people that you're going to speak to are not going to be receptive to the things that you have to say. There are going to be those who are going to obviously resist the message, and some are going to want to physically injure you. But he says in verse 7, you're going to speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse. Now, these, again, are the same people, basically, that Jeremiah was called to speak to. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, God had said to Jeremiah, do not be afraid of their faces. I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. One of the things that I've discovered is when the Lord will say to you, I want you to go and I want you to speak, all you need to do is speak the words that he gives to you. That's all you need to do. You know, very often what, what I'll do is I prepare a message, but I want to, I, one, I pray. I say, God, what is it that you want said? Two, I outline a message. I have a, a, a passage that I prepare a message in. And then three, I go in and I simply deliver what I was given. And that's how you should do it. That's how it works. You go in there, and as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you may change some things or develop some illustrations. You may, you may move in a direction that you weren't anticipating, but God still moves through that. I remember on one occasion, I was doing a funeral service, and there was a young girl who had gotten into an argument with her boyfriend, and the boyfriend had driven away, and this young girl hadn't finished the argument, so she climbed into her car, and she raced after him, and as she was driving after this young boy, her boyfriend, she was trying to pass cars to catch up to him to continue the fight. And, and she, was in, uh, she was in an attempt to pass a car when she ran head-on into a car coming towards her. She was going 50, 55 miles an hour when she hit this young mother and her small children in a car. And this girl, this high school girl, was killed in the accident. And, and uh, she didn't come to our fellowship, but they called and they said, could somebody please do the funeral for, for her? And, and I did that funeral. And I remember going to, uh, to the uh, chapel there, and it was a chapel filled with kids. Kids, they were all high school age kids. And, and, uh, and I remember walking in there, and I had my service all written out, and I began to share with them. And, and, and I look into the back, and as I'm looking into the back there in this chapel, there are these girls who are kind of giggling and laughing and, and nudging each other, and they're not listening at all. And I remember thinking, this, this, this message that I have outlined really isn't what God wants me to give. And I, I remember kind of folding it up and putting it under my Bible and then just preaching to them and sharing with them and opening my heart to them and encouraging them. They needed Jesus Christ. 
you know. And I remember doing that. I remember sharing with them. And, and the kids got quiet, and they listened more respectfully, more attentively. And um, I went to the graveside and, and performed graveside duties and, and left. Never knew exactly what had happened until a few years ago, a lady in our fellowship walked up to me, and she said, I had given this illustration. She walked up to me and said, you know, um, my brother was the one that she was chasing. And he was there at that funeral service, and he heard the message you gave. She said, something you don't know is he gave his heart to Christ that day, and he's a member of this church and had been in this church all this time. He had never introduced himself to me. There are times when the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart, and he says, just say the things that I tell you to say. And that's what's taking place here. God says, I want you to give my word. Don't change it. Don't adapt it to suit the hearer. Give the message that I have laid on your heart, and I am telling you what I want you to do. You are a steward of my message. Remain faithful and deliver that message. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul said, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. So God goes on to say in verse 8, But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth. Eat what I give you. When I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me. Behold, a scroll of a book was in it. He spread it before me. There was right in on the inside and on the outside. Written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. So he says, Son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not show the same attitude of rebellion that this nation shows. If you're going to be effective at all, you need to be faithful, which is going to contrast with the rebellion. And so he sees a scroll. What's interesting is this hand with the scroll, as he sees the scroll, there's writing on both sides because during that time, scrolls were normally written on one side only. So that reveals a tremendous judgment that is coming. And these he refers to as lamentations, mourning, and woe. And he goes on in chapter 3 to say, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth. And he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly. Fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate. And it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. So when he says you need to partake of this, the messenger of God needs to first partake in, in, in God's truth. That person needs to internalize God's truth, and then that person preaches it. So that's the picture here. He's taking God's Word, internalizing it, and then he's going to give it out. You give what you receive. You can only give what you receive. If you're in the Word of God and you're, and you're reading the Bible and memorizing it and growing to understand the things of God, then it's going to be coming out of you when you have an opportunity to share. The Lord will give you something fresh every day from His Word. It's like manna from heaven. And you'll read your Bible, you do your devotions, you read through the Proverbs or whatever it is that you're doing, you're going through the Bible in a year, whatever your devotional time is, and, and you're taking in the Word of God. And so what you need to do first is you need to receive it, then you internalize it, and then you, you give it. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. So you give what you have taken in. Now, notice how he said in verse 3, he said, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll. This is a message of judgment, but the scroll is sweet because it's God's Word. Psalm 119, 103 says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And so you're going to take of it, and it's going to taste sweet because it's God's Word. And because it vindicates God's holiness and righteousness, this is something that will resonate in you, and that's why it is sweet. Well, he says in verse 4, Son of man, go to the house of Israel. Speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely I have sent you to them had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. So he says, you're to speak my words to them. You know, I was 
when I was going through this, uh, this is a little aside. Um, when I was going through this, I have to tell you, I'm one of these who actually has a sense of certain things that really, I, that occupy my mind. And one of the things that occupies my mind is just the state of the church today in the 21st century. That's something that I think about quite often. It's, it's really uh, something I read about and I, I, I do some personal research on, and I do that actively. That's, that's what I do as a minister. And, and I don't bring out a lot of things in my studies to you um, other than the things that it, it will like gel into a certain sense that you'll get whenever I teach the Word of God. The most important thing, and if I were to leave you with anything, and, and, and were this to be the last time I ever spoke to this fellowship, what I would say is the most important thing as a minister of the gospel, which we all are in this room, by the way, is to never water down the Word of God, to never water it down, to never change it, to never peddle it. You know, Paul said we are not as some peddling the Word of God. When he said we're not as some peddling the Word of God, what Paul was saying is we don't adulterate it for personal gain. We don't take the Word of God and, and change it to make it acceptable to man so that man will support us. So man will, will say, oh, we think highly of you. He said, we don't do that. He said, what we do, he says, and what we're to do as stewards of God is to be faithful to him to preach the message. You see, when you go through the whole counsel of God, when you take it verse by verse, you're going to find things that absolutely cause you to soar into, into the third heaven. You're, you're going to read things in that passage there about the blessings and goodness and mercy and compassion uh, of God. You're going to see the things that relate to the Spirit of God where He gives you joy and He gives you peace and, and He gives to you so many spiritual blessings and, and, and you're seated with Christ in heavenly places and there are a variety of things that you can find that you've been made rich in Him in so many ways that you can just stay there and you can just, just enjoy that so much. And there are other places where God gives warnings, where God says, this is, this is my concern. And Ezekiel's one of those books where God is giving a warning. He's given a warning to the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel has, has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They have begun to pursue idolatry. They're listening to false prophets. And so God is speaking to Ezekiel, and he's saying they're going to have a rebellious heart. Notice how many times he called them rebels and rebellious. He said, this is their heart. They're turning from me. You need to come and warn them. You need to speak to them. They're going to be hard-hearted and hard of face to you, but you need to do this because it's God's word, this message that changes lives. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul said, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. It's God's word that works effectively in you, and it's God's word that Ezekiel was handed, and it's God's word that he was supposed to distribute, even though the people were not going to want to hear what it is that he has to say. Isn't it interesting, as we just looked at this, that God made it clear that he's not going on a foreign mission. God even says, if you're going to a foreign mission, they'd be more receptive to you and more receptive to my message than my people. Fact is, is you're speaking to those who have already heard and have rejected and rebelled. I've discovered that sometimes unbelievers are more open to the gospel than those who call themselves believers. There are entire nations that are hardened to the gospel. Europe is filled with nations that are hardened to the gospel. One of my friends, Randy Walls, as a member of his fellowship who's from Spain, from southern Spain, and he's there trying to plant a church, Calvary Chapel Ministry in, in Malaga, in southern Spain. And um, he went to the Bible college in Murrieta, graduated, started a home Bible study there in, in southern Spain. He's a Spaniard, married to a Spaniard. And uh, he invites his friends to come to church on Sunday. And his friends recently were saying to him, you know, we want to be your friend, but please stop inviting us to church. There are 45, approximately 45 million people living in Spain, 45 million, out of which less than 1% are actual Christians. This is a nation that at one time prided itself 
in being holy Catholic Spain. You can go to England, as I have done on several occasions, and you can go into, into cities. You can start with London, but you can go to some of the villages, and you will discover that what used to be a thriving church, a building that had many people coming to receive the Word of God, you can go into that church, and it's been transformed into a shop. It's been transformed into a coffee shop. They have um, discos there that, that there used to be churches, and they're selling them off and turning them into mosques. And as you go there, you see that England at one time was the mission-sending nation of the world. Some of the greatest missionaries who ever lived, David Livingston, Hudson Taylor, and so many others, came out of England. And yet England today is less, there are more people going to a mosque than there are people who go to church. And you can see that in France, and you can see that in Austria. You can see that in Germany. You know, Germany was the center of the Reformation. We have Martin Luther, a German man who brought in the Protestant Reformation. You can see the same thing in Switzerland. You can see throughout the entire region where at one time there were people there with thriving ministries, tremendous uh, callings of God with, with multitudes of people responding to the, to the Word of God, some of the greatest preachers who ever lived coming out of nations of Europe. And now you go into Europe and now you speak the Word of God to them. Churches are empty and people don't want to hear it. That's what's taking place here when God is speaking to Ezekiel. He said, if you went on a foreign mission, they would listen to you. If you went into Uganda and you took the gospel, they will come by the hundreds to hear you minister. Some of the greatest revivals that are taking place right now are in what used to be called third world countries. You see things taking place in South America and the African continent and various other places that at one time had been very close to the gospel, and now they're open and God is moving in tremendous ways. And then great nations like, like ours are having difficulty with this one message, a message of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, the house of Israel, verse 7, the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. Your work and efforts will amount to nothing, Ezekiel. Your ministry will be a failure. Now, their exile and affliction hasn't softened them. It hasn't awakened them. It hasn't caused them to realize that they need to repent. Their hardness of the life that they're living is not working on them. Uh, making them humble instead of recognizing that they're in captivity as a result of rebellion he's saying they're going to resist this message verse 8 behold I've made your face strong against their faces your forehead strong against their foreheads like adamant stone harder than flint I've made your forehead do not be afraid of them nor be dismayed at their looks though they are a rebellious house Ezekiel your name means God strengthens that's what Ezekiel means. So I will make you strong, and you'll live up to your name. And your faithfulness to me will be stronger than their unfaithfulness. Isaiah 50, verses 7 through 9 says, The Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. If God be for us, who can be against us? I learned this lesson, and I'm learning this lesson, but I learned this lesson going to secular college stepping into classrooms where the professors would actually openly say on the first day of class when they were introducing themselves that they pitied believers. And I walked into the, those classrooms as a new believer. You know, I'm 58 years old now, but I haven't always been. When I went to college, I was in my, my 20s. I graduated out of high school at the age of 17 with a D minus average. I didn't like to read. I didn't like to study. I didn't like to speak, and that's all I do now. Didn't like to do anything like that. And that's what God called me to do. It's an amazing thing how God has a sense of humor. He really does. And I was a hippie, and hippies were 
The kind of people who said, you know what, live and let live. What's the big deal? Why get uptight? If he wants to believe that, he wants to do that, leave him alone. What's the big thing? It's not bothering me. If it doesn't bother me, why should it bother you? That was my attitude. And when I got saved, this is the truth. When I got saved within the first few months, I went into the military within the first few months of my salvation, I began to pray something. I began to pray, God, please give me something to believe in that I will hold fast to and feel strongly about. Give me something of a spiritual spine is what I was saying. Help me to know what truth is and a willingness to present it and an ability to defend it. And help me to be able, in the face of opposition, to not back down, to stand my ground, and to be able to give a reasonable explanation concerning the things that I hold fast to. Help me to be a person who can articulate the depth of faith that you are placing in me. And I used to pray that. Listen, I might as well go into this for a moment. I didn't read like I said to you. You know, I've been doing drugs and alcohol for a few years from the time I was 15 till I was 20. I really didn't like to read that much anymore. But after I got saved, I started reading books. I started reading things by C.S. Lewis. I started reading various authors. There was a particular writer that I used to read, and um, I would actually read his books with a dictionary next to me because his words were so large that I didn't understand what he was saying. And so I had, a, I had the book and I had a dictionary. And when I got to a word that he used that I'd never heard before, I'd look it up in the dictionary. And I started increasing my vocabulary that, that way. That's how I began to expand my ability to communicate. That's when I began to, to learn to use words that were different and, and, and instead of the things that I used to say, because all I used to say is, cool, daddy, you know? <laughs> things like that, I mean, that was it. Hey. You know, man, a few words. And, and, and so I, I, that's how I began to learn to articulate. That's how I learned to, to be able to, to communicate and to find words that were uh, appropriate for that particular sentence. And that's what happened. And, and, and this was all because I said, I want to be capable of defending the things that I most surely am being instructed in. And I hope you're the same way. I hope you're the same way. Where you want to communicate... And yes, I went to Bible college for a year. Then I took off for um, a year from Bible college, and I went to secular college. And I was in the classes with political science. I was in the classes that people were not, you know, open to the gospel. They didn't want to hear the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that happened a lot. I, I, you know, I went to several, several colleges. I went to something like seven colleges. They weren't all Christian. And I'd be in class, and I was at Cal State Fullerton, and I was doing a class on marriage and the family, and, and they gave us something to speak about. And I went up there and, and spoke of, from James Dobson's book, Dare to Discipline, you know, with all these people who just were absolutely, you know, they were anti-Christ. They, they had no desire to hear those kinds of things. And, 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 and I would speak up in class, and, and no, I didn't have the ability to articulate my faith. I was a young man, but I had one thing that I want all of us to have. I, I had a belief, an aggressive belief, that this is true. These words are true. This is God's word. We ought to stand fast and communicate it. I believe that. And, and that's, that's the whole basis of this ministry. A willingness to stand up and be counted. A willingness to say, this is, this is what God says, and I'm going to hold fast to it, regardless of whether I look ridiculous or not, regardless of whether I have the capacity to communicate in such a way that you can understand, regardless of whether you make me look like a fool. I already feel foolish anyway. It doesn't really matter. Listen, before I came to Christ, I was a fool for the world. I'm a fool for Christ. Now, what is the difference? Well, the difference is eternal. And I want to make sure that I know Jesus Christ, and that's how it works, and that's what Ezekiel was called to do. That's what he was called to do. And God said, they're not going to listen to you. He said, but their faces may be hard and their foreheads may be hard, but I will make yours harder still. In their obstinacy to reject, I will give you a strength to continue. And they're going to see something in you. And that's how it was in his ministry. 
He says in verse 10, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you, and hear with your ears. Go, get to the captives, to the children of your people, and speak to them and tell them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. They're going to disagree with you. So first, receive my words. You can be tempted to water down what I say because people are resistant. But speak to them. Leave the results to me and watch what will happen. I will take care of this. Verse 12, the Spirit lifted me up and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice, blessed is the glory of the Lord from his place. I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another and the noise of the wheels beside them and a great thunderous noise. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So God awakens him to his glory, and he fills him with a desire to preach his message. Notice how he says he went in bitterness of spirit. He went in bitterness of spirit because that is what God is experiencing with this nation. And he fills them with this power and enables him to take the message out to them. And Micah, another Old Testament uh, prophet, in chapter 3, verse 8, said, Truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. I am filled with the power of God to communicate what God is saying. Well, in verse 15, I came to the captives at Tel Aviv who dwelt by the river Kibar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. So he begins his ministry there, but he does so without speaking. What he does, he just remains there with them, and it's a picture of him just suffering along with them. So his compassion is being brought up in him. It came to pass, verse 16, at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth. Give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you didn't give him warning, he shall die in his sin. His righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. Then the hand of the Lord was upon me and there, and, and he said to me, Arise, go out into the plain, and there I shall talk with you. So I arose and went out into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there like the glory which I saw by the river Kibar. I fell on my face. Then the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet and spoke with me and said to me, Go, shut yourself inside your house, and you, O son of man, surely they will put ropes on you and, and bind you with them so that you cannot go out among them. I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you shall be mute and not be one to rebuke them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who hears, let him hear, and he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. He speaks concerning the ministry of the watchman. The watchman would stand guard overnight. He would stand there on the, on the wall. And it was his duty, his responsibility, to warn the people when the enemy approached. In the cities, they would have city gates. The gates would be closed so that people could not enter in. And the watchman would be there on the city walls looking down, and he had to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so what he is, is he is being presented here as as a watchman, as a sentinel. Now, as a sentinel, as a watchman, he has 
the responsibility of crying out a warning. His message is a warning. His message is a warning that judgment is coming from the Lord. He's not to be like the false prophets who during that time are saying everything is just fine. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14 says, They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. So his message was to be a message to call them into an awareness that God was moving and they needed to get right with him. Again, I think that's what verse-by-verse -verse teaching helps us. It helps us to be instructed and protects us. It's a way of warning us from danger. And so you have a responsibility. You're the watchman. Now, as you cry out and you say, there's danger coming, if that person that you spoke to, speaking of the message, refuses to hear, it's not your fault. They chose to reject it. They are guilty. But if you do not cry out a warning, then I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Now, what's interesting in verse 20, he says, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because you did not give him warning. He shall die in his sin. His righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. His blood I will require at your hand. He's not saying that this is a truly righteous man in the sense that he has a right standing with God. He'd be speaking of a nation that is totally rebellious, as you've seen God say over and over again. This is the guy who within that nation has an appearance of righteousness because he's not as bad as the average person. You know, you can have a group of people who are really, really bad, even in prison, and there's one, one person who's going to be amongst all these people who have been locked up because they're really bad who's not as bad as the rest. And in a society, you can have people who have the overt or the outside appearance of being a righteous person. And so the Lord is speaking here not concerning somebody who's truly righteous because righteousness is a, is a, is a result of having a right relationship with God. He's, he's speaking about somebody within the nation who, who has an appearance of righteousness who doesn't turn from his wickedness. He's not right before God. And what he's going to do is, in the message, the person would ultimately hear that he isn't right with God and actually turn to him. But if, if, if Ezekiel doesn't give the message to somebody because he has an appearance of righteousness, and the guy is actually an unrighteous man because he's not right with God, then Ezekiel's going to have responsibility in that. Just bring that down home to in a basic uh, illustration. This is something that I, that I experienced, and this is something I've had people talk to me about. And I'll, I'll put it like this. I didn't experience this particular thing here, but this is something that has been said to me more than once. Pastor, how do you share the Lord with your grandma, who is such a good woman? How do you do that? How do you speak to your grandma who goes to church all the time and she's always, you know, just been good? How do you do that when you know that she's never really received Christ? She's just religious. How do you do that? You know, there are people who will say, well, I'm just going to trust the Lord to somehow reach that person when God has already entrusted you with the obligation and responsibility to do that. God, that's what you're supposed to do. But because we don't want to give grandma a heart attack, we don't, we don't say it. We don't say anything to her. I had an aunt. We called her the monk, my Aunt Julia. Very devout Catholic, very devout Catholic. And uh, I got saved. And uh, she came over. And I wanted to tell my aunt she needed Jesus Christ. She was my mom's oldest sister. And there I am, a snotty-nosed 20-year-old. And here comes the monk. <laughs> and she came into the house, and she looks at me and says, So, David, how are you? I said, I'm fine, Aunt Julia. I just became a Christian. We're all Christians. <laughs> so I started to tell my auntie, my mama stepped in because she knew she, this woman was going to get all berserk on me, you know, beat me with her rosary beads or something, you know. <laughs> I just, when I got saved, I'm still the same. I have not changed. I'm still the same way. 
I wanted my loved ones to know Jesus Christ and was willing to get them angry, more than willing to, because they need to know the truth. And, and if, if I don't tell them, I can't expect somebody else to. I just can't. I just can't. I cannot take the chance that somebody else will tell my dad about Jesus Christ. I can't do that. So I did. So I did. So I tell daddy he's a good man, and I say, you're the best man I'll ever know, but you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. That's a pretty heavy thing to say to your dad, but I didn't have a more articulate way of saying it. You know, and maybe that's a good thing because daddy gave his heart to Christ as clumsy as I was, and mama did too. They heard, and they, they said, something happened in this person's life, and whatever it is, that's what I want. You can have people in your life that have an appearance of being righteous, and so you don't think they need the Lord. When I met Marie, the first day I met her, my brother had told me about her. He has said, I'm working with somebody that I really like, David, and I wish you would meet her. So he invites her to the Bible study I'm teaching so I could meet this girl, Marie. She was a nice gal, man, and I liked her. You know, I thought, oh, she's sweet. And we're talking. And, and she's a college gal, and she looks at me, and she goes, so what's your sign? That was the big thing back in the 70s. What's your sign? And I said to her, the fish. <laughs> so she says, oh, you're a Pisces. I said, no. I said, Ichthus, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in that junk. That was our opening conversation. She put up with it. But you know what? Two weeks later, she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Two weeks later, because I was willing to tell her, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need him. As good as she was, as good as she was. She was a, she was a Girl Scout in high school. She was a good person. <laughs> I would have robbed her. <laughs> if anybody didn't have the appearance of needing Christ, my wife, Marie, had the appearance of... No, she had the appearance that she already was a Christian. She had that appearance. People didn't witness to her because she was so kind and sweet. They said, surely she knows Jesus. She didn't know the Lord. She needed to hear it. And I had the responsibility as a Bible study teacher and as a Christian to tell her, you need Jesus Christ to come into your life so that you might have a relationship with God that lasts forever. That's what we're called to do, you see. So some people will receive, some people refuse. My responsibility is to be a watchman, a sentinel who cries out, there's danger coming. And God says, you be just faithful in the message and allow the results to be left in my hands. So God says, that's what you're going to do. Finally, in verse 24, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, spoke with me, said to me, go shut yourself inside your house, and you, son of man, surely they will put ropes on you and bind you with them so that you cannot go out among them. I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you shall be mute and not be one to rebuke them, for they are a rebellious house. When I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. He who hears, let him hear. He who refuses, let him refuse. They are a rebellious house. So he goes into a plane. He receives the final words of his commission. At first, he's to refrain from open ministry. He goes to his house. When the Lord in verse 25 says they're going to put ropes on you and bind you, it, more than likely this is spiritual in the sense that they're going to try and keep you from preaching. They're going to stifle you. But God says, I'm going to give you the words to speak when it's my time. I'm going to keep you silent, but I will also open your mouth. You're going to speak only when I permit you to do so. That keeps you from speaking out of personal concern or anger or any motivation outside of my 
direction. And the only thing that you will say to them is the word that comes from me. Thus says the Lord God. That is what we're called to do, is to make sure that we give forth God's word when we share. We do not dilute it. We do not try and mask it. We don't try to change it. We simply present it. Like they say, just let the tiger out of the cage. Just let the word of God go and watch what God will do.